So this video is going to help you with paraphrasing versus quoting and making decisions about when you should paraphrase material in your paper and when you should just directly quote it. A sort of helpful rule to use as you're trying to make those decisions is only about a quarter or 25 percent of your paper should be direct quotations. That means most of it, more than half, should be you actually paraphrasing information into your own words. So let's start by looking at the sample paper. If you need to get to it from your video dashboard, it is linked right here, model research paper about Mary Fisher. So click on that, and here we can look at sort of an example of when you should be paraphrasing and when you should be quoting. Basically the rule is you should only be directly quoting something when the words themselves are really, really important, and you actually putting them in your own words would lose some really important aspect of them. Some examples might be that the piece that you want to directly quote is actually something that your speaker said um, and you have some actual information about some conversation they had or some really powerful piece of information that they actually spoke and so you don't want to change that because a lot of that meaning is lost if you put it in your own words. Or in this case, let's look at when this student chose to paraphrase versus directly quote in their first body paragraph, historical context. So they say, by the time Fisher gave her DNC address, the AIDS epidemic had been going on for more than 10 years. The first official reporting of the disease in the United States was published in June of 1981. So, so far, they've just paraphrased information, just background information about when AIDS was first reported. It was about five gay men in Los Angeles with, and here they directly quote, unusual infections indicating that their immune systems were not working. So I'm going to look at why they maybe just chose to directly quote this piece of information. They took it from the first official reporting, so it sounds like this is actually from the report itself about the first time that AIDS was reported in the United States. So that does feel worthy of actually putting in the actual original words. So they, they, it just, it helps us to understand, like they say unusual infections, indicating their immune systems were not working. Unusual infections definitely are, isn't language that we would use now. We would just say that it was HIV. We now know what the infections that these men had were, but I think that the student made a good decision in using this original language in this direct quotation because if they were to put it into their own words you would sort of lose that original lack of understanding of what HIV was that this original report um, sort of sums up. So this is one example of when you might want to actually use the, the original words and directly quote because there's some significance to those original words. And you'll see that the student then goes on for the rest of their paragraph. Let's see if they have any more direct quotations. They do. They say that even today the World Health Organization cites fear of stigma and discrimination as the main reason why people are reluctant to get tested, disclose their HIV status, and take antiretroviral drugs. So here I think this is another good decision about making a or using a direct quotation because it's directly citing the word, the official language that the World Health Organization uses to explain a main cause for people not being open about their HIV status. This is something also that's coming directly from this organization is exactly how they're reporting it now. So there's value in using that language, but just giving background about when different people got AIDS and, and when it was becoming, when it was at its peak of killing people and things like that, those don't need to be particularly in the actual words of the source. So, and you can see, they sort of follow that rule, about a quarter, no more than a quarter of their actual writing is direct quotations, they've got one here, all of this is paraphrased, and then they have one here. We can even look further, they've got one here, and the rest, they've got one here. In this paragraph, they have one here, and that's the only one in that paragraph. So you can continue to look at this model to help you sort of determine when you should be quote directly quoting and paraphrasing. I'm actually going to go through this process, show you how I make the decisions. So for my paper. So I'm ready to start writing about my historical context. 
and I've got my historical context outline laid out. And this is a process that you should actually go through with me. So if you don't already have your outline open right now, pause this video and get your outline open. Okay, so when I'm looking, when I'm about to start writing a whole section of my outline, or a whole section of my paper from my outline material, I sort of overview and look at what is the part that I actually want to use and paraphrase, and are there any parts in here that I actually want to directly quote. And so if I look over this information, this is all about just sort of the civil rights situation in America when JFK took presidency. It's just sort of summing up the different ways that African Americans were not equal in America when John F. Kennedy took presidency. There's nothing that I think I couldn't just paraphrase and put in my own words in a better way. So you should be looking at your, well, here, let me finish this. So then as I look here, as I look here, I can see that this is a description about Kennedy making some last minute decisions about what to include in his inaugural address and what to leave out. And Kennedy actually says that he's worried about all the like people who are disagreeing about things going on in the United States. And so he at the last minute said, let's drop out the domestic stuff altogether. And so that's, those are actually words from Kennedy himself. And I think that that sort of just adds some credibility to my paper if I can actually add in some things, some thoughts Kennedy actually had himself about this speech that he was about to give. So I'm going to actually highlight that because I think that is going to be something that I'm going to directly quote in this paragraph. And then this is about how the Cold War had been going on, how it had been going on a long time, people were getting really upset and concerned about it, and here's a sort of timeline of Cold War events so that I can put really into the Cold War into context the speech and like what was going on in the Cold War leading up to when Kennedy actually delivered his inaugural address. So the only thing that really stands out to me in all of this that I think is worth putting in the direct words of the original source that I'm going to quote is this thing that Kennedy himself actually said. So pause this video right now and do this same process where you go through a section of your research that you're going to turn into a section of your paper and make decisions about if, if you see any th language in that part of your research that you really want to keep in its original form that you would want to directly quote in your paper. And then everything else as you go ahead and write should be paraphrasing. So do this process I just did just in your outline. Okay. Once you've done that, then you just have the work of paraphrasing things and connecting all the ideas together and then directly quoting in the spots that you have made the decision to directly quote. So if it's helpful for you to watch me do this process, that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to sort of do the beginning process of turning this into a body paragraph for myself about the historical context for this speech. So let's see. Basically, this is, I'm going to paraphrase, and really, I'm not going to go into all this detail, so I'm going to sort of shorten all this stuff about the civil rights movement. So it starts off with when JFK became president in 1961, black Americans, especially those living in the south and border states, and I'm not going to go into that detail, I can definitely say I'm going to drop that out, um, were denied legal equality and human dignity. They could not vote, were bar barred from public facilities, were subjected to routine insults and violence, often carried out by law enforcement officials, and cannot expect justice from the courts. They're second-class citizens. Okay, so I'm going to sum some of this up. I'm going to start with this language and rephrase it a little bit. So here's my paper. When John F. Kennedy Instead of became, let's say took, became president, I'm going to say took office. When Jan F. Kennedy took office in 1961, black Americans, I'm going to say African Americans, African Americans were, and I really liked where it said second class citizens, I thought that that really summed it up well. So I'm going to skip ahead from all this detail and say that they were second-class citizens. And I'm not, that's not plagiarizing because I've said African Americans and I've connected it with this stuff up here, so I'm not using the exact same phrasing. Were second-class 
citizens. I'm going to give some of those examples they gave. They can have vote, or barred from public office, African Americans could not vote. Instead of barred from, I'm going to say they could not take, they could not vote, take public office, or Oh, sorry. They could have vote. They were barred from public facilities. Okay, never mind. African Americans cannot vote. Could not, or were not allowed in many public facilities. And often faced violence from, what did they call them, law enforcement officials. I can say that because I have not used the same phrasing up to there. From law enforcement officials. Okay. Now I'd like to connect this idea that even though these big things were going on in America at the time, Kennedy actually doesn't talk a lot about them in his speech. He sort of just refers to them at the very end by saying that those human rights to which this nation has, been, has always been committed, to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Although these were significant issues in America, Kennedy decided to decided not to focus on them in his inaugural address. making a last minute decision, and now I'm going to directly quote him, to drop out the domestic stuff altogether. And he did this because he was afraid of partisan because he was afraid that people were too divided. So to drop out the domestic stuff altogether because of or maybe I'm gonna say out of out of fear of people's disagreements over local issues in the past election. Okay, now I'm going to do some citations. So whenever I have a direct quotation, I have to put the citation right after it. So this was from Nelson. And then this stuff. Let's see, where is my last sentence? All that civil rights stuff came from the JFK Library source. John, oops, John F. Kennedy Library. And if I'm ever unsure of a source, I'm not sure, I'd have to look back and see if that actually is how, if that's actually the title of this source and how I'm actually going to cite it. So if I'm ever unclear on anything in my paper, I want to go back and double check it, but I want to keep sort of typing right now, I highlight it just as a reminder to myself that like I need to go back and check if that's actually how that source is going to be cited. That's actually the title of the article. So those are how I make decisions about how to directly quote versus paraphrase. You should be doing the same work as you go along in your paper. Good luck, and I will see you in the...